Windswept House uh, was published in 1995, July of 1995. It is now coming out in paperback. And we're talking with uh, Father Malachi Martin, who is the author, best-selling author of that book and other books of interest, uh, The Keys of This Blood, The Final Conclave, and The Jesuits. Uh, welcome to the program, Father. Good evening. Thank you. It's good to be with you, Michael. Uh, let me ask you this before we get uh, into the, uh, the into the heart of the interview. Mm -hmm. Since Windswept House was published in 1995... It was 1996, Michael. I'm sorry, 1996. June 1996. Okay, since it was published in June of 1996, yes. what, uh, what has changed? In, in what? In the church? In the church. Um... It, the word change is, 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 is not exactly the word. Um, the, uh, it would be more accurate if you, if you said to me what has developed or what has decayed, what has gone up the least, what has, in that sense of change, you know. Mm -hmm. Change can be a positive thing, and uh, most of the changes in the Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church since uh, June 1996 have been negative. They've been negative. Uh, definitely negative. We're, uh, uh, as an organization, we're going down. We're not going up. Okay. Uh, and that in most significant ways and insignificant ways. So if you, if you ask me to change in that sense, the general overall remark would be that change is for the worse as regards the organization of the Catholic Church, the institutional organization composed of bishops and priests and dioceses and parishes and religious orders and institutes and schools. The overall picture is a blighted one. Now, let's talk about how, because I, some of my listeners in the audience are obviously non-Catholic. Um, what... I want to connect these things because I think they all do connect, and in previous conversations that we've had, yes. they do connect. Um, first of all, how did the church ever get into this state? Why is the Catholic Church the brunt or the focus of, say, the, the uh, I, I, I guess a, a good word would be conspiracy, by a certain group of people to, well, to get rid of it? it well, you see, the... The, uh, the word conspiracy can be used, provided one understands what a conspiracy is, because, for instance, I don't think you have read the uh, board meeting, the notes for the, the June on July board meeting of the New York Times, have you? No. And yet they meet and they plan and plot the progress of the paper. They conspire together, mm -hmm. but they're not going to publish uh, what they talked about. Right. So we speak about conspiracy in that sense, yes, but there's a wider sense of the word conspiracy. It is the, uh, the, the prejudice against Roman Catholicism in the United States. It's the last respected bigotry, which is quite allowable in the United States. You can uh, no longer be publicly bigoted about Jews, about blacks, about homosexuals, uh, even about Mormons. Uh, or Muslims, but you can, and are uh, quite tolerated, be very bigoted about the Roman Catholic Church. It is, it is the last respected bigotry of Americans. If I may read a quote from Winston Churchill, you know, uh, the thing about conspiracy is interesting. Uh, now, we're going to touch on this, too, because I'm sure this has a large part to play in this. Yes. But he said from the days of Spartacus Weishaupt, to those of Karl Marx, who was also known as Moses Mordecai Levi, That's right. and down to Trotsky, Bela Kuhn, Rosa Luxemburg, and Emma Goldman, mm -hmm. this world conspiracy for the overthrow of civilization and for the reconstitution of society mm -hmm. on the basis of arrested development of envious malevolence and impossible equality has been steadily growing. Mm -hmm. Now, that's Winston Churchill. Yeah. Now, he refers to a gentleman by the name of Weishaupt. Yes. How much of what is going on in the world today uh, regarding the Catholic Church and the New World Order, how much of this has to do with Adam Weishaupt? Uh, a very great deal, because uh, Adam Weishaupt was a, a great Freemason, member of the Lodge, uh -huh. and uh, the Lodge are in the forefront of the uh, general effort to neutralize and um, offset the influence of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, it's, it's, you know, Michael, when you get down to the point of speaking about conspiracies and plans and plots, of course, you will be laughed out of court 
uh, because they'll just simply say, well, uh, he is a conspiratorial type. He relies on conspiracies. Right. And um, the, the, therefore, it's, 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 it's not a very uh, useful way of um, describing what's happening in the Catholic Church, especially since uh, you're trying to put the blame in the wrong place. The changes that have taken place in the organization, the institutional organization of the Roman Catholic Church, uh, the changes have been the deliberate work of three popes. John the Twenty Third, who was Pope from 1958 to 1963, Pope Paul the Sixth, who was Pope from 63 to 78, mm -hmm. and John Paul II, who was Pope from 1978 until this day we're talking. Okay, now they introduced the changes. They deliberately did so, uh, and all the devastating changes have, uh, having been that have been introduced was directly the work. Was, uh, all of them were directly the work of those three popes. So, I mean, uh, what I'm saying is that no matter what enemies the Roman Catholic Church has, and it has enemies, mm -hmm. uh, and who hasn't got enemies, and uh, we have rather a wide swath of enemies all over the world, we have, there's no doubt about that. And a lot of them are Freemasons, yes, and a lot of them are Jews, a lot of them are not Jews, uh, a lot of them are just free thinkers, a lot of them are other religions like Mormonism, which heartily abhors the Roman Catholic Church, mm -hmm. um, as do, do many sections of the Baptistic tradition. And there's a lot of those in America, there are about 90 million Baptists in the United States of different Baptistic traditions. Right. But they, they don't account for the deterioration of the church. What? I guess the thing I want to do when we come back for break is I want to get into what does account for, for the deterioration of the church because I think that the audience will be surprised to hear that not only is it working for the deterioration of the Catholic Church, but it has much, much more far-reaching implications. Am I correct? It's a wide, wide application. Yes. We're talking about not only the Catholic Church. I don't want anybody to get the wrong impression. This is not a program about the Catholic Church per se. However... What is going on with the Catholic Church is that the Catholic Church appears to be, and not only appears, but is, a major player in the upcoming New World Order, which we hear so much about today. And as we're going to hear from my guest, Father Malachi Martin, in just a moment, uh, there is also another element in this mix that uh, is working in other areas, and we're going to touch upon all of those And a uh, very interesting program. Welcome back, Father. Okay, thank you. Now, before we went to break, we were talking about, you know, the deterioration of the Catholic Church, and we were talking about... As an organization. As an organization. Yeah. Let's talk about why this is occurring. Yeah. The, before we do that, uh, we should make it clear to, at least I should make my mind clear to the, our listeners, namely that the, uh, we make a radical distinction between the the institutional organization composed of bishops and priests and dioceses and parishes and institutes and schools and universities and libraries, uh, and so and as our German cousins say. Between that, the institutional organization, and what we call the mystical body of Christ. And what is that? It is the assemblage of all those in a state of grace, what the Roman Catholic called a state of grace. And they are either in heaven, or they're in purgatory, or they're on earth, and they're observant Catholics. Okay. There's a distinction between those two elements that make up the Roman Catholic Church. Okay. Now, what is deteriorating is the organization. And uh, the question we've just touched on, uh, the fundamental question is, what is caused her? And my remark was that it's our own doing. It was done by us to us. It was done by three popes, followed by their bishops, through the institutional organization. Why? Because of a, a meeting held in the 1960s, from 1962 to 1965, where a very clever parliamentarily uh, sage group of cardinals and bishops, under the prodding of two popes, decided to draw up a blueprint for the church in the future which would effectively uh, liquidate the central mystery of uh, Catholicism, which is the Mass, and which would reduce the status of the Pope, and that's a key element, reduce the status of the Pope to the status of the first among equals. 
And both of those things require explanation, but it was a blueprint drawn up, and it's taken just about 30 years to implement. And John Paul II, Pope John Paul II, the present Pope, is the, he has achieved finally the, uh, the, the, the complete deterioration of the organization itself. Now, you can ask what is the motive? Why? The motive, I think, was is misguided, of course, and uh, was wrong in its calculation. Mm -hmm. But there was a great urge in the 60s at that meeting of the bishops. There were 2,800 of them, by the way, gathered in St. Peter's for three years. Now, this is Vatican II you're talking Vatican about. Vatican II, from 1962 to 1965. Uh, they, the spirit amongst them, and fomented by the popes in question, and by the cardinals, and the cardinals are very important officials around the Pope, the spirit amongst them was, at all costs, at all means, let's get with the world. We've been isolated. We're antediluvian. We are not talking to modern man as modern man understands talk. We're not with him in building his habitat. We've been too busy uh, with our own spiritual matters and theological uh, development and uh, uh, converting people. Let's take a completely different attitude and let's join the world. And uh, let's modernize everything. And the, the big word that John Paul, that Paul, uh, John the 23rd, uh, used was aggiornamento, which means bringing things up to date. Now, that was their spirit. And in order to do that, they jettisoned, in the Vatican Council, they jettisoned sacred traditions that had always been traditions in the Catholic Church back to the time of uh, the first popes in the first century. Peter, Linus, Pelagius, Clement, and all the others. Mm -hmm. They jettisoned those and substituted more modern-sounding doctrines, uh, especially on two or three capital points. One was about human liberty, the other was about marriage, the, the, the meaning of marriage and the, the purpose of marriage. Uh, a third was concerning the Holy Father, concerning the Pope, the Pope's authority. On those three points, they uh, changed completely the organization of the Church. Um, now, why did they do it? I think it was a mistaken uh, zeal to belong to the modern world, to catch up with it. And uh, we have caught up with it in the sense that, uh, you know, Michael, today, if you study any country, any country at all, even some place, some mess of a country like North Korea or uh, Albania, you'll find that, but in all normal countries, you'll find always there are three components, and only three. The first important component is the government. Government is terribly important nowadays, much more important than it was for our grandfathers and grandmothers. Mm -hmm. And the second component is the business community. And it's, in many countries, it's more important than the government, as in Switzerland or in Russia, modern Russia, uh, and in the United States. Business is the, it's the, uh, it's the fulcrum that moves the whole country. It's a big thing. And the third component is what we call that rabble of NGOs, non-governmental organizations. Everything from the International Firemen's Association to Mothers Against Drunk Driving to the Catholic Church and to all the churches. We are just NGOs. And it's, a phrase, it's a name taken from the United Nations. And we're in the marketplace. We're no longer consulted, especially by anybody. No church is. All governments are independent of that. Even the so-called Muslim countries like Saudi Arabia and uh, Iraq and Iran and all those. The, uh, the religion has very little to do with the way the government is run. Now, there is an underlying... Wait till I finish this. Okay, go ahead. Now, the... the um, the the uh, the change is that the church is now competing in the marketplace and competing with the weapons of competition, not with its spiritual power, not with its spiritual power. And therein lies the conflict. And losing the battle because the only weapons put in the hands of the church by Christ, who founded the church, are spiritual weapons. 
That's it. So that's where the, I think the difficulty started. Now, so much so, Michael, that, and this is going to shock some of the, even our non-Catholic uh, listeners, we have now, the Catholic Church, in its latest uh, statistical index, has just published that we, uh, Catholics number one billion plus. Wow. But out of five billion, a population of 5.5 billion. And yet, we, you can safely say, if you're going to be frank, and uh, of course, as the British say, bloody minded, you're going to tell the truth and say that certainly two thirds of those Catholics throughout the world, Latin America, Europe, Asia, Australia, Canada, uh, USA, two thirds are being led by the nose unknowingly out of the Catholic faith because they're not taught the Catholic faith as it was always taught. Is this part of a, and I, I will, we'll answer this on the, after the break, but is this part of a larger grand design by someone? Well, the only person who really designs history is Christ. Okay. He is the king of history. All right. And therefore, it's what he has in mind that we should concentrate. Of course, there are little plots and plans, and there are little foolish little lodges of Freemasons making their plots and plans. And there are still communists, and there are still anti-Catholics, and there are still sort of uh, official atheists. Uh, you know, there's everything as gross as NAMBLA, the North American Man-Boy Love Association, up to, uh, uh, you know, something uh, like Marie Strong runs. Uh, sort of natural religion and uh, and uh, recourse to a completely earthly life. I guess this is Father Malachi Martin, author of Windswept House, a novel talking about the uh, the main theme of the book is the the undoing or the uh, the destruction, if you will, of the institution of the Roman Catholic Church. We're talking about reasons that uh, this is occurring, and I wanted to find out because one of the elements that we find in in your writings, Father, is that. There is a hev it's heavily laden with uh, uh, references to Fatima. Yes, it is, and uh, uh, that enters into the wider picture. We'll have to explain Fatima very briefly for our listeners so that they refresh their memory. But if they don't know about it, but the the um, the key, uh, Michael, for me is this: when I survey <coughs> what. The churchmen have done to the organization since 1960. What they have done to it to, uh, to, to destroy it and make it deteriorate. Um, my feeling is, my theological feeling is, that Christ, who is the head of the church and the savior of mankind and the king of all nations, <coughs> concluded when they had made their plans that were going to lead to this uh, uh, desiccation and deterioration of his church, the or institutional organization of his church, he said, okay, go ahead. You know, Christ has a very, very permissive doctrine in this matter. For instance, I can drink liquor. So can you. Right. He won't send an angel to stop me becoming a drunk becoming a, um, uh, an alcoholic. Yeah, that's your free will. Yeah, that's right. He won't, he won't send an angel. And similarly, if I want to spread my wings as a sexualist, I can get all the diseases in the world, including AIDS. Mm -hmm. He won't send an angel. You give him the means to survive and flourish. You neglect them. Goodbye, pal. Sometimes he will exercise excessive mercy if somebody is praying for me. Uh, and preventing me going too far. But that's a pure grace, and there's no guarantee it will ever come to me. Right. Similarly with the nations and with its churchmen, they want to make short-term judgments because they feel they want to be amongst the honored people of the nations. They want to be in the United Nations. They want to be acclaimed as modern men. And they want to be uh, completely à la page, as we say in the French, uh, with all the new developments, then Christ will say, all right, you know it's wrong. You know it's not my work. Your work is to save souls, period. And the only victory you should really claim is when somebody dies in communion with the church and doesn't go to hell, goes to purgatory or heaven. That's the only victory you should really claim. But you want another victory on earth. 
You want to build man's habitat. And you want to share in the glory of creating a new civilization, which is what two popes have said explicitly in the last 30 years. That has nothing to do with my message on the cross and with the salvation I, I won for you all. But go right ahead, because I'm now getting tired of this organization. And just as I will leave a human body racked with liquor and with a, a, a venereal disease, I will let it perish, if that's the free will choice of a man. So I will let this perish and build something new in its place. So I think it's the permissive will of Christ letting men's perversity, churchmen's perversity and infidelities uh, work out to the destruction of an organization which in the final count he doesn't need. He doesn't need. It's, I think it's as simple as that. Uh, and you see, Michael does that. There's a scene in the Gospel, you know, when, they, uh, when Christ was crucified and died and put in the tomb, the day following, two fellows, two of his disciples, decided to get out of Jerusalem because the Jewish authorities were looking for supporters of this Jesus whom they had just put to death as a troublemaker. Mm -hmm. And they started walking out to reach a town called Emmaus, which is about six miles from Jerusalem. And they were fed up because they had counted on this man, Jesus of Nazareth, they encouraged them to expel the Romans and reestablish the glory of the kingdom of David and reunite the twelve tribes and make Israel a name amongst the nations. And uh, he, 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 he was now a corpse. And they were talking about this with the usual face. And they met this stranger walking along who looked quite jaunty and happy. And he said, Shalom Lachem. Hello. What's up, what's up with you? Why are you so sad? And they said, what's up with you? Do you not know what happened? They told the whole story of Jesus and they counted on to expel the Romans and create the kingdom. And they said, he's now dead. So we're getting out. We're out of here, as, the, as we say in America. <laughs> and he said to them, well, oh, that's fine. Uh, I'm going the way you're going. Why don't we chat about it? And by the way, have you read Moses, the Pentateuch? And have you read Jeremiah and Isaiah about the suffering servant? And have you read uh, the other the other apostles, the other uh, books of the Bible, which is our possession? They said, yes, we have. Well, they said, did you not notice that every one of them, especially those you respect deeply, speak and say that the Messiah, if he does come to expel the Romans and recreate the kingdom of Israel, he must die. He must die crucified as a worm and no man, broken to pieces. And then by that time when they reached, they reached Emmaus and he pretended, the Bible says, to go on. Thinks it ire in the, in the Latin version. He pretended to go on. They said, no, 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 why don't you stay with us? Because as you talked, our hearts are burning. We've got some fire and some light in it. Why don't you come in and have some bread and wine for the night anyway? You can go on after that. He did. He went in, and they ordered bread and wine. And then at the break, he broke the bread into three portions. And at that moment, they recognized their beloved Jesus. And then they knew. So they paid their bill, I suppose, and rushed back to Jerusalem to talk to Peter and the others. Um, and say, we've seen him. And the Peter, of course, said to him, listen, we've seen him already. We know. He's not going to be outdone by any member of the team. And this is the fact. This is the, the brute fact about Christianity. We were founded on a gibbet, a cross, a dying man bleeding, all his blood, mocked and whipped like a cur, and then buried in, a, in, a, in somebody else's tomb. Remember when Jesus took Andrew and Peter, I think, and John, he took them up to Mount Tabor, and he was transfigured in front of them with this brightness of divinity. And when they were coming down, he said to them, now we're going to Jerusalem, by the way, and I'm going to be crucified by the chief priest, mm -hmm. and on the third day I will rise again. And Peter, of course, the big boss, said, no, you won't. We, we've just been watching you and, and, uh, and the prophets talking, and God the Father, come on. And Jesus said to him, get behind me, Satan. Meaning, uh, you're stupid. You don't know, you don't know the things of, of God. It behoves, it is necessary, it is fitting that I, the Messiah, be put to death and die, and thus enter into my glory. And apparently this is the law he has for his church. We've had our human glory in the papacy, 
and in the Roman Catholic Church for almost two millenniums. That's a long, long time, mm -hmm. two millennia. Yeah. And uh, we have deteriorated successively since the 16th century, and now we're coming to the end of, of this uh, of uh, Catholic times as they were. And uh, he is allowing this because he finally wants to have a church which is without spot or wrinkle, as Paul says, his bride. And this organization is not without spot or wrinkle, as what? you and I know. So that's his holy will. And that means that we're heading for a time when we will have at least dry martyrdom, if not very wet martyrdom. And it means the deterioration of the public image of the church. It means exclusion from the councils of the great. It means that we're going to be a vast minority, uh, treated as a dangerous minority. Uh, and we've got to put up with that until the skies light up with the presence of Mary and Jesus. Is that, would that be interpreted as the end? No, 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 just a, a changeover completely. Just a message. Yeah, because the, 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 the Antichrist hasn't been, hasn't been active yet. I mean, there's a whole, there's a whole chapter to be played out. But the, the coming chapter refers to this uh, desolation of the vineyard, this destruction of the organization, which is auto-destructing as Paul VI in his misery towards the end of his life, and he helped mightily in it, he said the church is auto-destructing itself, it's killing itself off. Talk about some of that uh, also in this program tonight. Um, Father, for the, for the, to wrap up the, uh, the National Hour, yeah. let's get a closing comment. Basically, we're in 1998. Is the Antichrist alive in the world today? Do you think he's there somewhere? Oh, he's alive. But he's not. His time isn't yet. He's not. His public function has not started. Okay. Because he will have a public function. And by the way, there's no. If if you if you want to spend a couple of minutes on it, there's no question we will recognize him. It, well, it, the Bible is absolutely explicit about it. What are the signs? There'll be three things we will know it's the Antichrist. First of all, the world will be faced with problems that are insoluble as in our present condition of technology and wisdom. That, that wouldn't be far off. No, it's not far off. It's around the corner, but we're not there yet. Okay. We're not battled yet. There's, if you go to the United Nations, I've went to the United Nations every week of my life. There's a jaunty, we can do uh, 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 spirit, which will be broken, of course, but uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm no schadenfreude about that. I have no joy at that. It's going to be misery for many people compared to which the misery of Rwanda is a passing joke. Anyway, to, but the, the first thing is there will be insoluble problems, uh, problems that will, will harrow the souls of men and women, number one. Number two, there will be a map, visible, tangible, with a name and an identity, and he will have the solutions. He will have real solutions. That's the second sign. Number three. Number three is that people will turn around and say to him, you must be divine. You must be. And we will worship him. divinity, and of course worship him, and he will say, yes, I am. Kneel and kiss my feet. And people will. I believe that people will. They will. Lots of them. When you see that, then take your wife and kids and get the hell out of the way because there's going to be a lot of trouble. <laughs> I know we laugh, but it's probably not going to be something to laugh at a no, time. Well, because in that day, there's going to be, we have experienced down in Florida, in Flagler County and a few more places, fire from heaven. That is. A joke compared to what's going to happen. I understand. We're about out of time uh, for this first okay. hour. Okay. What are you working on now? What projects are you working on now? You're working I'm, on another book. Three projects. What are they? Two of the, yeah, writing, of course. And then I have a lot of consultation and a lot of talking. When is your next book coming out? Uh, that depends on the opportunity. It, 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 at the present moment, the condition of the Catholic Church is so iffy that I, it's too long to explain in a few moments that uh, it's very hard to know when is the best time to publish a book. Because uh, whatever book I publish, I wanted to hit the button for that particular period. Uh, Windswept House did because they predicted what was going to happen. Yeah. Uh, down to details that really angered an awful lot of churchmen because they felt that I had spied on them. I hadn't. 
Uh, <laughs> well, hey, their game needs to be exposed, and I think you've done a very good job of doing it because uh, there's a lot to this.